Hey guys, today I'm going to be going over my top 10 favorite Christian theologians. Now, Christian theologians are people who study the Bible, study the gospel of Jesus, and answer the really hard questions about it, think about what it means, how we can apply it, how it relates to other ideas. And of course, the most important theology book is the Bible itself. But we're not supposed to interpret the Bible in a vacuum. We're supposed to interpret the Bible along with the rest of the church, the church being the community of all Christian believers. And not just the church here right now in the 21st century, but the church throughout all the ages, throughout all these 2,000 years. So that's why it's important to know theologians from all different time periods. So in this list, some of these theologians are modern, some of them are ancient, some of them are medieval, some of them are pre-modern, and early modern, you guys know what I mean. It's important for the church to interpret the Bible together. It's important to understand church history to see how the theology and proclamation of the church has evolved and developed over time. And by the way, this picture here is my church, my Presbyterian church. Okay, let's get started. So the first theologian, my 10th favorite theologian, is N.T. Wright. He is the only one on this list who is still alive. And he is, I think, a former bishop in the Church of England. Now, the Church of England does have a lot of problems, but N.T. Wright is solid. He is not theologically liberal. And that's what I always say. The mainline churches, more generally speaking, which includes the Church of England, also includes my denomination, they are largely hijacked by theological liberals, but not entirely. There's always a conservative minority, and N.T. Wright is part of that. So he is an Anglican. He's more of a Reformed Anglican. So theologically, he mostly agrees with the Reformed tradition, which I'm a part of. But his main idea is about the gospel and interpreting the gospel in a first century context. When we think about the gospel, it's too often about going to heaven, about escaping this world and going to heaven. And he helps us understand that that's kind of a Gnostic view of the gospel. The Gnostics were these early heretics that were around the time of the early church who said this physical world is bad. And the point of Christianity is to escape the evil physical world and go to the good spiritual world. And a lot of times when we talk about the gospel as simply, how do you get into heaven, it seems kind of Gnostic. So N.T. Wright says, the purpose of Christianity is not about escaping this world and going to heaven. It's about heaven coming down to earth through the church. The gospel, if you read the Bible, the gospel is not defined as a theory, a method for going to heaven. The gospel is Jesus died for our sins and is bringing the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God means heaven is coming down to earth. Heaven is going to transform earth and the new heavens and the new earth are not going to be something completely different than this world. It's going to be a redeemed and transformed version of this world right here and right now. And that's what we're going to live in forever. Now, N.T. Wright does not deny that when a Christian dies, their soul uh, lives on and is with God in heaven. But that's not the end of the story. Heaven is the intermediate state. Heaven is the waiting room. The final hope is not escaping to heaven. It's heaven and earth becoming one. So that's really what he is good about. And the book I'd recommend from N.T. Wright is the book On Earth As It Is in Heaven. That is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer doesn't say, uh, may I go to heaven. It says, may God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the gospel. It is heaven coming down to earth. And that is very important. N.T. Wright is really into kingdom theology, that the gospel is about the kingdom of God coming down to this world and transforming it. And the kingdom of God isn't going to be fully here until Jesus returns, but we live in what's called the already not yet. The kingdom is in one sense already here, so we're supposed to work to improve this world in anticipation of when Jesus comes back to make everything right. All right, number nine is Abraham Kuyper. Now, he is a Dutch theologian who lived around the turn of the 20th century. He was also prime minister of the Netherlands. I think that's really cool. I really don't like when conservative Christians kind of retreat from culture. Like, you will find a lot of conservative Protestants these days, but they're not involved in culture at all. They're generally living off in some farm in rural Alabama, and that's meaningless. You need to be involved in the world to have a transformative impact on the world, and that's exactly what Abraham Kuyper did. He was a Dutch Reformed theologian. He wrote a lot of theological works. But his main thing is about making Reformed theology transform the culture. He was also a political theorist. And his political philosophy is kind of where I get my political views from. I don't talk about politics much, but my political views aren't Democrat or Republican. It's Neo-Calvinism. Neo-Calvinism is the ideas of the Reformation applied to politics. So generally, Neo-Calvinism, it's very similar to Catholic social teaching. There's a lot of similarities between Catholicism and Calvinism that a lot of people don't understand. They're a lot closer to each other than both sides think. 
basically neo-Calvinism is more left-wing when it comes to economics and more right-wing when it comes to social stuff. So a neo-Calvinist might support universal health care, but also completely be against any LGBT or abortion stuff. So that's neo-Calvinism, but it's more than just about the policies you support. Abraham Kuyper really shows that Christianity in general, and Calvinism, Reformed Christianity specifically, has done more work to transform the culture for the better than anything else, uh, than any other religious tradition. So if you want to listen to something from Abraham Kuyper or read something, I would strongly recommend his Princeton lectures. Uh, he went to America, he went to Princeton Seminary and in New Jersey and gave these six really good lectures really showing how Calvinism improved the world. It, Calvinism improved everywhere it touched. And a lot of people ask me why I'm still a Protestant, given all the big mess that Protestantism is currently in right now, which it is. I'm trying to fix it. It's because um, Abraham Kuyper and a lot of other people can really demonstrate historically that Calvinism does a lot to improve culture. Calvinism has the biblical understanding of humanity and sin and responsibility. Uh, Calvinism has the strongest view of sin out of any Christian tradition, and that means it's also the most accurate view of sin, because humans suck, in case you haven't noticed. So yeah, Abraham Kuyper's great. Kuyperian theology means a theology where you believe the church's job is to transform the culture, as opposed to radical two kingdoms theology, which I strongly reject. Radical two kingdoms theology is taught by the Escon Westminster Seminary in California, the Escondido School. And Radical Two Kingdoms theology says it's not the church's job to change the culture. And you'll have professors there like R. Scott Clark and Michael Horton and David Van Drunen. I actually kind of know some of those people personally, but I really don't like their theology. They're nice guys, and uh, a lot of uh, PCA people that I know actually went to seminary there. But I don't like their theology. It sucks. Kuiper is the way to go. All right, next up, number eight, we have John Williamson Nevin. Now, he's the only one on this list who is American. He's an 1800s theologian. He was from Merkersburg, Pennsylvania. Now, during this time, the most prominent Reformed Presbyterian theologian was Charles Hodge, and he did good work. Charles Hodge was good in arguing against, like, liberalism and stuff, but the problem with Charles Hodge is he had a very low view of the sacraments. Now, the Reformed view of the sacraments, the Calvinist view of the sacraments of baptism and communion, is that they are not just symbols. A lot of people think Protestants think the sacraments are just symbols. Maybe Baptists believe that. Maybe Evangelicals believe that. But that's not what the Reformed tradition says. None of the, none of the Reformed confessions say that. The sacraments are means of salvation, but only for those who have faith. So the difference between us and Catholics is that we, we think the sacraments are only effective for those who end up having faith, meaning the elect. They're not effective for everyone. But even so, the Reformed teaching is that the sacraments are means of salvation. They are things God works through to save us. He doesn't need to work through them. He could and sometimes does work without them. So they're not absolutely necessary, but generally they are the instruments God has set up to work out our salvation. Uh, so the Reformers had a very high view of the sacraments, except there was this one guy, Charles Hodge, teaching at Princeton Seminary, who developed a very symbolic view of the sacraments and completely misinterpreted the Reformed view. So John Williamson Nevin was very good at arguing against that, very good at arguing that the truly Reformed view of the sacraments is a real presence view of communion, and he didn't talk about baptism as much, but it sort of implied that baptism also is really a means of salvation. So he wrote a book called The Mystical Presence, defending the truly Reformed view of the Lord's Supper, and this book this book is my favorite theology book ever outside the Bible. Better than any of the Reformed scholastic works I've read from like the 1600s. If you are going to read one theology book that is not the Bible, you need to read The Mystical Presence by John Williams and Nevin. I actually, let me, let me show you. Oops, uh, I have a copy myself. This is my copy of The Mystical Presence. So yeah, you should read it. Anyway, number seven is Samuel Rutherford. So, oh, my camera's getting messed up. So I mentioned that I like uh, the mystical presence more than any Reformed scholastic work, and that's saying a lot, because the period of Reformed scholasticism was actually very important. That was the period that came right after the Reformation. The Reformation was when the Reformers said a lot of stuff. The Reformers sort of went mining to uncover the gems 
of the of the biblical teachings the scholastics they sort of took the raw materials that the reformers mined and they refined it so they took those raw gold ore and refined it into like gold jewelry and stuff so the scholastics were these very very nerdy academic theologians who put the ideas of the reformers into neat theological systems and there are so many great reform scholastics I figured I could only include one of them in my top 10 list. So some honorable mentions that are not Samuel Rutherford are like Francis Turretin, who's an Italian Reformed scholastic, uh, Gisbertus Vucis, who is Dutch Reformed, uh, Johannes Wolibius, who is Swiss Reformed, Johannes Makovius, who is Polish Reformed, and William Perkins, who is English Reformed. There actually are the, the Reformation spread everywhere. There are Calvinists from all over Europe, basically even places you wouldn't expect, like Poland and Italy. But the best, my personal favorite reform scholastic is, of course, Samuel Rutherford. He is Scottish. Samuel Rutherford was very important for the development of covenant theology, which is the way reformed Christians read the Bible. Basically, all the covenants God makes in the Bible, whether to Adam, to Noah, to Moses, to David, and the new covenant with us, they're all administrations of the same overarching covenant. So that means the promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament apply to us today because we're the same group of people. We see a lot of continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we disagree with people like dispensationalists who think God has one plan for Israel and another plan for the church. We would disagree with that. We would say Israel and the church are the same group of people. Israel is the church and the church is Israel. Uh, there's nothing unique about biological Jewish people today. God's chosen people are just his covenant people from Old Testament Israel to the New Testament church. There's a perfect line of continuity. And the covenant of grace, God's covenant, is always salvation by faith. You are saved if you have faith in God's covenant promises. Now, why do we need the covenant of grace? Well, because we failed the covenant of works, which is a covenant God made with Adam and therefore with all of humanity, because Adam represents all of humanity, a covenant God made with Adam in the garden. It basically says, obey and live, disobey and die. We disobeyed, we all deserve to die, and God would be completely just in sending us all to hell because we deserve it. That's Calvinist Reformed theology. Uh, but God was gracious and gave us the covenant of grace where we can save by faith. Uh, faith in who? Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled the covenant of works on our behalf. Jesus is the new Adam, because Adam failed, but Jesus succeeded. So by faith in Jesus, through the covenant of grace, we can be saved. And all of this is the outworking of the covenant of redemption. This is not a covenant God makes with humanity, it's a covenant God makes with himself. The Father chooses to save a group of people, the Son dies for those people, and the Holy Spirit changes the hearts of those people to make them Christians. The covenant of redemption is a covenant between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Samuel Rutherford was also one of the Westminster Divines at the Westminster Assembly. This is the meeting in England that wrote the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is the main Presbyterian Confession of Faith. Uh, in my denomination, at least, it's not the only Presbyterian Confession of Faith, but it is the main one. And the Westminster Confession of Faith is, I think, the most detailed, well-researched, and educated confession in all of Christianity. Now, other denominations like Lutherans and Catholics and even like Methodists and Anglicans, they have official confessional statements of faith, but objectively, none of them are as detailed as the Westminster Confession. Westminster Confession is in super fine detail with biblical references absolutely everywhere, and it was a meeting of all of the greatest Reformed minds of the time, of the 1600s, of Reformed scholasticism, all gathering together to figure out all the important questions. Now, it didn't answer all the questions possible. I think there were later questions that arose later in time, which is why I think it's good that we have more modern confessions like the Confession of 1967 in addition to Westminster. Westminster is still probably the most important for Presbyterianism. Something I like about Samuel Rutherford uniquely, uh, something I like about the Scottish divines, the Scottish Westminster divines more uh, specifically, because a lot of the people at the Westminster Assembly were English rather than Scottish, is their appropriation of the ideas of Duns Scotus. And Duns Scotus is my favorite medieval theologian. Uh, the Reform Scholasticism was really just a, uh, a new reframing of medieval scholasticism, which was from the medieval Catholic Church. And Duns Scotus, Scotus gets his name from being Scottish, and because the Presbyterians are Scottish, they adopted a lot of the ideas of Scotus, especially Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford made the Presbyterian tradition a kind of reformed Scotist tradition. Now, what are the ideas of Duns Scotus that I'm so excited about? I'm glad you asked, even though you probably didn't ask. 
Duns Scotus is my favorite medieval scholastic theologian, because Calvinist theology is really just a reformed version of Catholic theology, so the reformed scholasticism is really just inheriting the ideas of medieval Catholic scholasticism. Scotus was from Scotland, which is where he gets the name Scotus from. He and Thomas Aquinas were the two most important medieval scholastics, and they agreed on a lot of stuff. There's way more agreement between the two of them than disagreement. One of the things they agree on, by the way, is predestination. They both believed in predestination. So a lot of Calvin, a lot of Catholics will attack Calvinists like me for believing in predestination. Anyone who's doing that doesn't know what they're talking about. Because the medieval Catholic Church also believed in predestination. At least a lot of the most important people. Not everyone, but a lot of the most important people in the medieval Catholic Church believed in predestination. Now, some Catholics will be like, no, they only believed in single predestination. Calvinists believe in double predestination. Anyone who's saying that doesn't understand what single predestination means, doesn't understand what double predestination means, and doesn't understand what Calvinists actually teach. They think that because we believe in double predestination, we believe God is actively sending people to hell, like God actively predestines people to hell. But that's not what double predestination means, and that's not what we think. What we think when we mean when we say double predestination, what we mean is that God actively predestines some people to be saved and simply passes over the rest. And that is exactly the same as what Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus and St. Augustine teach. So listen to like my good Catholic friends, like Christian Wagner from Scholastic Answers, another YouTuber, great YouTuber. I really respect him, even though we disagree on some things. He will tell you that there is no difference in the predestination of the Calvinists and the predestination of the medieval Catholics. There is no difference at all. People who think there's a difference are really just misunderstanding both. But anyway, some things they disagreed on are the specific metaphysics of God. So Thomas Aquinas would define God as pure being. That, that's not a bad way to define God. I wouldn't say that's wrong, but Duns Scotus preferred to define God as the infinite. And I'm just realizing I misspelled Scotus here. Whoops. Uh, God is the infinite. And I really like defining God as the infinite because I like mathematical proofs for the existence of God. And defining God as the infinite just makes a lot more sense. I think that's a more biblical way to define God. Also, even though both of them believed in predestination, uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was an infralapsarian, and Duns Scotus was a superlapsarian. Superlapsarian is like the more hardcore type of Calvinism, and I recently became a superlapsarian as well, so I like Duns Scotus. And if you have questions about Scotus, you should ask the Byzantine Scotist, who is a Catholic YouTuber that I really like, who is a big fan of Scotus as well. The reason Scotus was a superlapsarian is because he had a very high view of the Incarnation. Superlapsarians believe that God decided to do predestination without even considering the Fall, whereas infralapsarians think God's predestination is simply a response to the Fall. So Thomas Aquinas believed that the Incarnation of Christ, of Jesus becoming man, was only necessary because of Adam's sin. So Jesus is sort of like the plan B to Adam's plan A. Adam failed, so now we need Jesus to come back and fix everything. But Scotus believed in a more absolute necessity of the Incarnation, where Adam, even if Adam hadn't sinned, Christ would have still come down to earth and taken on human flesh because the Incarnation has a greater purpose than simply remedying human sin. Scotus believed that this world was created for the Incarnation of Christ, and that is absolutely biblical. The Bible says all things were created for Christ. So Scotus um, takes that to mean that all things were created for the Incarnation of Christ. And that's why Scotus was a superlapsarian, and that's why I am also a superlapsarian. Now, my fifth favorite theologian is also Scottish, and it is John Knox, the father of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. Now, I wouldn't say he invented Presbyterianism. I think Presbyterianism comes from the earliest of the apostolic churches. But Presbyterianism gradually evolved into a more Episcopal system, and John Knox restored the church in Scotland to a more Presbyterian system, and he also applied the ideas of the Reformation. John Knox was a really, really great reformer, 
and he wrote the Scots Confession, which is my favorite confession of faith. I mentioned that in my denomination, the PCUSA, we use the Westminster Confession, but not only the Westminster Confession, we also use the Scots Confession, which I personally like a bit better than the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Scots Confession is extremely clear that we do not believe the sacraments are just symbols. As John Knox says in the Scots Confession, and I have this part memorized, we utterly damn the vanity of those that affirm the sacraments to be nothing else but naked and bare signs. Assuredly, we believe that by baptism we are engrafted into Christ Jesus to be made partakers of his justice by the which our sins are covered and remitted. So yes, and John Knox was very, very fiery. Everything he writes, you can smell the passion in it. I love John Knox. My fourth favorite theologian is Saint Anselm. Now, Anselm is probably the most important theologian that defines Western theology after the split with the Eastern Orthodox. Anselm was the first major theologian in the West after the Great Schism, and he's sort of the father of medieval scholasticism. And he also thought of the ontological argument, which is one of my favorite arguments for the existence of God. It defines God as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Either God exists or reali in reality, or he only exists as an idea. But existing in reality is greater than existing as an idea. So, by definition of God, since God is defined as that than which nothing greater can be conceived, God must exist in reality, because existing in reality is greater than just existing as an idea. The reason I prefer this reasoning for understanding why God exists, the reason I prefer this over Thomas Aquinas' like, argument for motion or causality, is Thomas Aquinas sort of starts from earthly things and reasons his way up to the heavens, whereas Anselm starts with God himself. He grounds his reasoning for the existence of God in God himself, I think that's the most pious way to argue for it. Um, so yeah, Anselm is really great. Um, he's my fourth favorite theologian. Uh, Anselm's book, Cur Deus Homo, about, which means why the God-man, why Jesus had to be truly God and truly man. That is an excellent book. I highly recommend you read that. My third favorite theologian is, well, John Calvin. John Calvin is one of those geniuses that everyone tries to claim. Not everyone, obviously. A lot of different people try and claim they're following the ideas of Calvin. You know that someone was a genius if so many different groups that disagree with each other will try and claim they are following that person. So, like, I don't know, traditional Reformed scholastics, uh, traditional Presbyterian covenanters, uh, Reformed Anglicans, Neo-Orthodox theologians, they will all try and claim Calvin, and that really shows how brilliant he was. Uh, he preached in St. Pierre's Cathedral in Geneva, and he really reformed Geneva in such profound ways. Some people call him a Christian socialist because he basically eradicated poverty in Geneva. He said no one should be poor, applying that biblical principle. And he really reformed education and law. He made Geneva a great place. The reason Switzerland is like such a prosperous, advanced society today is sort of because of the reforms that John Calvin made. So he wasn't just thinking through this theology in his head. He actually implied it, uh, applied it to help improve the world. So John Calvin's magnum opus is his institutes. It takes a long time to read them, but I still... Actually, I don't recommend you read this because it's great, but he says a lot of things that I'm sure most of you guys already know. If you would like to read it, you could read it, but you can learn Calvin's ideas without reading it. As someone who did read the whole thing, you don't need to read the whole thing. It's long. It's Calvin is not quite as skilled a writer as John Knox, even though his theology did have a more wide scope of influence. Now, my second favorite theologian is Augustine. What Calvin was really doing in the Reformation is really just bringing back the ideas of Augustine. Augustine also believed in predestination. Augustine's version of predestination was exactly the same as Calvin's. I would say that Duns Scotus's view of uh, predestination was a bit different than Augustine, because Scotus was a superlapsarian, Augustine was an infralapsarian. But yeah, Augustine really defined the biblical doctrine of how salvation works over and against the Pelagian heretics. Pelagians were these heretics in the early church that denied original sin. Original sin teaches that from the moment of conception, we are sinners and we deserve hell. That means there is there are no innocent people, aside from Jesus, of course. There are no innocent people. From the moment of conception, we are born in sin. We deserve hell. Pelagians were people who denied that. And a lot of people, including, I'm sure, a lot of you, are Pelagians. 
it's simply intuition. A lot of people, because of our sinful hearts, we don't like to believe we're sinful. Because of our pride, we like to believe that humans are basically good. Pelagius was sort of um, applying this Jewish idea of free will and humans being a blank slate. He was applying that to Christianity. But Augustine corrected it with the biblical teaching of original sin, which that from the moment of conception, from the time we are babies, we are sinners that deserve hell. And it's hard, it's a hard pill to swallow, but Augustine is foundational for all of Western Christianity, not just Calvinism, not just Protestantism, all of Western Christianity. That means Protestantism and Catholicism. So if you're Protestant or Catholic, you have to reckon with Augustine's ideas in some way. He was uh, from the... Roman province of Africa. He's an African theologian, but his ideas extend to every part of the world that Western Christianity has touched, which I would say is the majority of the world. So uh, Augustine was massively influential, and the only theologian outside the Bible, of course, that I think is greater than Augustine, the number one goes to Athanasius. Athanasius is someone that every mainstream Christian tradition respects. We're talking Protestants, we're talking Catholics, we're talking Oriental Orthodox, we're talking Eastern Orthodox, we're talking the Assyrian Church of the East. Why is that? Well, because he was the hero of the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea made sure to clarify that Jesus is truly God, but the, the Arian heretics, the heretics following Arius, still denied that Jesus was God. And Athanasius worked endlessly to defeat the Arian heresy. The Arian heresy was taking over the church. And Athanasius got exiled five times. Not once, not twice, five times for defending the truth against the heretics. If he had given up, we would all be Arians and we would all be going to hell. Now, of course, I don't believe God's providence would allow that. But you guys know what I mean, hypothetically. Athanasius is an example to all of us, no matter what kind of Christian you are, to never give up on fighting for truth. That's why everyone can appreciate Athanasius. He wrote so many works on why Jesus is truly God equal with the Father. Now, I would also add Athanasius strongly believed in the Filioque. Athanasius always says that the Son supplies the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is from the Son. Athanasius describes the Spirit as being from the Son even more frequently than he describes the Spirit as being from the Father. I think that's worth noting. And Athanasius seems to follow the principle of sola scriptura. He never lays it out explicitly. But every theological point he makes, he defends it from Scripture alone, and he barely ever quotes any sources outside of the Holy Scriptures to support his claims. Um, so I love Athanasius. And another thing Athanasius teaches is that is theosis. Athanasius teaches that God became man so that man might become God. Now, become God does not mean we actually become God. We become what God is. Athanasius wasn't trying to say that. He was trying to say that we become partakers of divinity. Us finite humans partake of the infinite divine like nature in some way, but it is only mediated through Christ. Now, a lot of people think theosis is an Eastern Orthodox doctrine. Well, it is, but it's also just a Christian doctrine. All the major Christian traditions, including Calvinism, have a teaching on theosis. They just call it something different. Um, like, you might read through Calvinist works and say, oh, I don't see theosis mentioned here. It's because they didn't use the word theosis. They used the word union with Christ. But if you read the works of John Calvin or John Owen or Samuel Rutherford, it is, it is dripping with theosis everywhere. Um, and the reason I like Athanasius' teaching on theosis is it teaches the absolute necessity of the incarnation, which is also something Duns Scotus taught. It means even if we didn't sin, the incarnation still would have had to happen for humanity to be divinized. And another reason Athanasius is an inspiration to me is because, as you guys know, I am fighting to retake my denomination, the PCUSA, from heretics. And a lot of people like J. Gresham Mation gave up on the PCUSA after getting punished by the denomination just once. But Athanasius was exiled five times, and he never gave up. So that should be an inspiration to all of us. Anyway, thank you guys for watching this. I hope you guys will learn something from this. And even if you don't agree with me, you will still be motivated to study theologians, to study the Word of God, and to study the things of God. So thank you all and have a great day.